All right. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, today for our second in the Quantcast Innovate webinar series. Today's topic is COVID and the customer, 125 days of real-time U.S. customer behavior. Uh, I'll be your host today and um, handling all of the Q&A at the end, so please uh, remember to put your, your questions in the Q&A as they occur to you, and we'll deal with them at the end for about 15 minutes. Um, my name is Travis Landrum, and I am the head of North American Ad Sales here at Quantcast and have the, the good fortune of working with tons of great advertisers and people throughout my six-year career here. Um, as, as we've learned over the past you know, several months, uh, COVID has thrown really everything um, into a new uh, state of being for us. And with the IAB in May announcing that seven in 10 folks will be open to new brands, customers' mindsets, and their openness to changing um, brands and, and how they will interact with marketers has, has never been faster and has never been more wide open to all of us. So um, it's never been more important to critically examine who your customer is and how their thinking has changed over this period of time. Um, in today's um, session, Peter will walk us through what we have been seeing and, and how we're helping advertisers to understand these changes and how live data can help them be more intelligent in the decisioning um, that they're making to reach these customers. Um, Peter is our CTO and is responsible for all the development of products um, and solutions that marketers and publishers alike use to make smart decisions in buying and selling effective advertising. Peter joined us 12 years, uh, Peter joined us um, three years ago and has spent the last 12 in financial markets. Um, Quantcast, if you haven't um, met with one of our commercial folks recently, is an audience intelligent and intelligence and measurement company headquarters in San Francisco. Um, we have been combining machine learning, a privacy by design approach and live data for more, um, for more than a decade and over 100 million online destinations. Um, Quantcast software provides information and advertising services for marketers, publishers, and advertising agencies worldwide. We were founded in 2006 and have uh, employees in 20 offices in 10 countries. With that, I will kick it over to Peter and we will start the session. Thank you, Travis. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I guess I won't know if not. Um, all right, so um, let me get these slides moving. A little bit about today. My hope, as always with these webinars, that you learn, you're a little bit inspired and you are also entertained. I think the last thing anyone needs at the moment is yet another boring hour on a video conference. Uh, by learn today, I'm actually going to sneak a little bit of machine learning in there and talk about how you make sense of online behavior. In my former life, I was once a university lecturer who used to teach this. So um, I brought you, pulled you in with the insights. We're actually going to sneak a little bit of uh, machine learning and statistics in there, but don't be too scared. Um, hopefully, you're going to be a little bit inspired by some of the surprising behavioral trends that have emerged throughout the COVID pandemic. And hopefully some of those, at least one or two of those, will be relevant to you and your role uh, and to your company. And as always, there's going to be some jokes. Um, if you find something offensive, just assume it's a joke. Okay, right. So first, the how. I'm going to spend about five minutes now explaining how we come up with all the insights that I'm going to present through the rest of this, um, th this kind of uh, presentation. So the how. Um, you might have seen slides that it's from, uh, from us before. Uh, we're very fortunate at Quantcast. We've been going for a long time now to have a very established rate relationship with a number of big publishers and apps. And also we've got free products that kind of torso and tail, which gives us kind of insight into user behavior as they move. It's over, we've hit over 100 million kind of web and mobile destinations now using our technology integrated into their sites, integrated into their apps, um, which helps them understand their audiences and also gives us a visibility into, into a lot of online traffic. Um, that by itself isn't enough. Um, we now kind of need to make sense of that live user data and increasingly now we're enriching that with kind of topic and sentiment, sentiment information that we can extract from web pages. What do I mean by this? Well, fortunately, the internet as a whole contains a hell of a lot of, informa of information about topics. So as you go to a website, um, I've got BuzzFeed up here. Um, you know what it's about because it's got all this stuff on the page called language. Right? And so because that's there, that's an amazing information source. And so what we do is we crawl the entire internet and we extract this stuff from the page, um, all this, this wonderful text here, the same stuff that you would read. And 
using advances in machine learning, we can kind of make sense of that. We can use something called natural language processing to kind of understand the meaning of pages in terms of the topics of those pages, in terms of the sentiment of those pages, based on the words that people are reading when they're there. You can kind of do the same with images, but we find with the internet, actually it's the text that has the most information. What that allows you to do is it allows you to build a model of the internet based on the topics of the pages. So every dot in this visualization represents an individual uh, domain in this case. I've got another one here that kind of goes down to the URL level. And machine learning is going in there, it's crawling the entire internet, um, and it's using the language on the pages, passing through things we call language models to kind of make sense of those pages, and it positions them based on whether they've got similar content on them. In reality, you do this across hundreds of dimensions. This model here is 768 different dimensions. Our visual minds can only take in three dimensions, so we project it down to three dimensions so we can visualize it. But you can kind of think of that we kind of move stuff close together in this kind of space about similar content, similar um, um, topics, and so on and so forth. And we move it really far apart if it's fundamentally different. The nice thing about taking this approach is you can also navigate it using language. It means that this area here has similar language, and I can use words to describe this area in space. So if I use words like weather and hot and cold and, and cloudy, I'll find this, this area of space down here. I'll find another area of space up here, which has got car reviews and so on and so forth. So the beautiful thing about taking this approach is, first, I can build a map of the entire internet, which helps computers understand it, because as soon as we've got coordinates associated with something like points in space, we've got numbers, and as soon as we've got numbers, we've got the entirety of maths at our disposal to kind of make sense of it and to help computers make sense of it. The nice thing about extracting content from pages is it positions it in something called language space. So as humans, we can kind of understand, well, okay, there's weathery stuff down here. There's kind of stuff to do with car reviews up here. There's stuff to do with um, cookery and, and Indian cookery and vegetarian cookery over here, right? So making sense of the internet is fairly fundamental to what we do. And there's broadly two parts of it. One is seeing how users are moving around. And the second is crawling the internet and organizing it according to the content of the pages. That allows us to see where consumers are spending their time and how they're moving around this space. How are they moving from this veg, they're looking at BBC, what was that, BBC uh, les vegetarian lasagnas and so on and so forth. And then they might hop over here and suddenly get obsessed with weather, right? And then we can see big patterns of large trends. So as we see consumers as a whole across the entire of the US, all of a sudden we see this burst of activity over here at this position in space, and we can understand it because we can generalize the contents and the topic and the, and the sentiment of those kind of pages. So that's kind of how we kind of make, make sense of it. We get live user data, um, which we're very fortunate to get from our, our amazing network of publishers. We enrich that with top, top, topic and sentiment information we extract from the pages directly. Um, we combine that to get this kind of live behavioral graph of the internet. And then we've built some more technology on top of that, some a proprietary database technology that we had to build from the ground up um, because we wanted to be, make that interactable. We want to be able to, to play with this understanding of human behavior and get answers back in seconds so that they can kind of drill in and slice and dice and do all that other kind of stuff. And we're very, very proud of that technology. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time telling you how it works today. It's, it's super impressive. Um, but everything that we do, certainly in our planning tools, is powered by this exact thing. So if you're one of our early adopters today and you play with the Quantcast planner tools, this is what you're using. We have live user data, we enrich it with all this kind of information and ultimately make that queryable to you through uh, tools like Audience Planner, which allows you to intersect billions of data points and see things that are true about your audience, be able to describe an audience, and we're launching this next month, I believe, um, where you're able to describe areas of space using language and say, look, I wanna, I wanna hone in on this area, people who are looking at car review sites, what else is true about them, where do they go after that, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of how we do what we do. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking you through how patterns that we've found using that approach. So we've looked at the kind of first 18 weeks of uh, kind of uh, life under COVID. Uh, we've measured kind of about 400 different interest truck types and we've kind of marked them against kind of week over week and also pre-COVID. We've identified some surges um, where we see a sudden kind of spike in behavior and we've seen some trends, which are things that kind of we, we're seeing kind of continued kind of interest in. And we're quantifying those as a kind of percentage increase. So I'm going to start with patterns we've seen in how people are coping with change. So how did people react to this kind of COVID situation? Um, 
The first thing we're seeing, really, really obvious, but people across generations are spending more, a lot more time online. Even boomers there are spending 22% more time online now than they did pre-COVID. I don't know whether that's because people are, are kind of uh, are just got nothing else to do or whether because now the internet has become the primary way that everybody is going about almost everything from buying things to ordering food to communication. But it's in across the generations, we're in a, a significant uptick in terms of amount of time spent online. Um, and it's interesting that this is across generations. And so now all of a sudden we're starting to see spikes in in the older generations, the boomers actually having a lot more interest and becoming a lot more educated in terms of what's available online. I think it's a massive audience to, to kind of tap in, into the coming years. Um, I don't see enough brands doing it yet, but I hope some will too soon. Um, but kind of going back to kind of week one, um, when all this stuff was kind of new, um, not on this... Um, not on this chart was the week after this, March 20th, which happened to be my birthday party. I was planning on having 150 people in my house for an 80s thing birthday party. That didn't seem to make the news. But a lot of other kind of things did happen around this time. I'm um, declaring a national emergency. I mean, this was a big shock to everybody. So how do people respond? So to look at this, we kind of looked across different generations and we kind of, we looked at the kind of content they were consuming to see whether it was kind of positive views on, on coronavirus, were people looking for good news or were they just, oh my God, the world's going to end. Um, how can I possibly escape this? And very early on, week two, after all of these kind of announcements, it was pretty negative across the board. Across all generations, everyone was pretty pessimistic. And then interestingly, the following week, everyone got a lot more positive. So um, we don't really know why this is. In all honesty, nobody really knows why this is. And I think sociologists and, and, um, and, and the like um, will have an amazing time um, kind of trying to, trying to understand these kind of big shifts um, and what was kind of self-fulfilling and, and, and what was just to do with how information was presented. But it was a fairly radical shift from people being all doom and gloom week two, then shifting in week three to a much more positive outlook. Interestingly, week four, Gen Z is getting more positive. Gen Z, the, uh, the, the younger generation, are kind of out there, still kind of feeling positive about COVID, whereas other generations were kind of a little bit more balanced. This is slightly negative at, at this point, starting to get back into the doom and gloom. And then by week five, we see a trend that seemed to kind of continue. By week five, Gen Z are consuming a lot more kind of optimistic news, some positive news about coronavirus, um, looking, to see, uh, looking to see some potential benefits there. Equally, older generations, boomers, um, are looking more positive. The middle generations, millennials and Gen X, are still feeling pretty negative about potential consequences of things. Um, now, this is a correlation. This is not a causation. It doesn't mean that if you're a millennial, um, you're, you're kind of naturally skeptical about the world. It's just the patterns I've seen in, online in terms of uh, content consumption. But the next question you ask is, well, why is that? One of the reasons I think this is true is this. Um, one of the big things that we've seen emerge um, is a real interest, obviously, in homeschooling. And most homeschool parents are going to be in those middle age categories. They're going to be the millennials. They're going to be Gen Xs. Right? And we saw a massive spike in interest in homeschooling. So around week three was when a lot of states were announcing that they were going to have schools closed for a, a significant portion of time. And we saw a massive increase at 1.9x versus kind of pre-COVID interest in kind of homeschooling related content. I mean, that's not a surprise. One thing that surprised me was that backed off again pretty quickly. So I think this was week three was when, oh my God, what the hell am I going to do with my kids? I'm going to read all this content. And I think by about week five, we think, ah, oh, screw it. I'm just going to shove them in front of the TV. Um, and then we've seen a big lull throughout the summer months. Now, we don't know whether this is because families are kind of into the groove. They know what they're doing with their kids or they think, well, hey, it's the summer months. They shouldn't be working on schoolwork anyway. Um, it could be a combination of both those things. And then more recently, we're seeing a big uptick as a lot of school districts and a lot of states are announcing that kids are going to be at home, uh, home educated and having kind of uh, distance learning for an extended period. We're now starting to see another spike in interest in homeschooling. Now, the past is not always a great predictor of the future, but one thing I would recommend, if you are looking to attach your brand into this massive interest in homeschooling in some way, please act fast. Last time it burst very, very quickly and then dropped off, right? And these spikes here are not generally the same people coming back. This is as different states have announced kind of, a, a kind of a homeschooling um, being the kind of norm 
And so if you're looking to act on this, do not wait. What we've seen in the past is that people online tend to go through an intense period of doing a whole bunch of research. They might get massively overwhelmed and then they kind of give up. So if you're looking to attach your brand to a massive interest in homeschooling and stay at home distance learning, act quickly so that you can kind of, so that you can get your message and your value proposition out there. Otherwise, I think you're gonna miss your opportunity. Um, other thing that we saw big trends in was how people are coping, coping with working from home. So um, initially, very early on, early pandemic, as you might expect, generally across the board, increases in interest in, in kind of searching and, and consuming content related to working from home, looking for desks, all that kind of stuff, particularly in the areas that are most affected, particularly in kind of the, the, the northeast areas. Obviously, there was a massive, massive um, and scary surge in cases um, around New York and those kind of areas. And so huge surge in interest in, in, in work from home activities. More recently, we've seen a massive interest in working from home in the kind of southern states and areas like Florida, right? So um, despite what you know, you might read in the press and various other things, we are starting to see as kind of cases are going up, we're starting to see more businesses close down, more people investing in staying at home for longer periods of time. A lot of the time people consume the work from home uh, kind of stuff is not because they think they're going to be home for a week, but because they recognize they're going to be working from home for an extended period. And so I actually think this is a, a slightly positive story in the fact that we are starting to see behavioral shifts in these areas. They might have reacted late, but it doesn't mean there's no reaction at all. And so there is some expectation in the southern states now that people are expected to work, are expecting to work from home for an extended period, and they're now kind of preparing um, for, for that. Um, another thing that we've seen is a massive shift in how people are kind of feeding themselves. Obviously very early on, um, restaurants were closed and everything else, and there was a huge interest across all generations um, in recipes. And across all generations, we actually saw um, that there was a fairly, you know, people wanted different types of food. And the types of food that you might only be able to get if you eat out. So we saw across the generations, people being interested in Indian and Thai cookery, for example. We saw a big diversification a big split when it came to types of brands that customers were going towards. And we saw the older generations going to more traditional food brands and younger audiences going to more of these up and coming kind of food delivery boxes. I actually think this is to do with the positioning of these products. I, my, if, I was, if I was in a creative agency or a media planning agency right now for one of these good eggs or gosh brands, I would be recommending to my customer, hey, there is a massive untapped audience who is spending a hell of a lot of money here. Our value proposition, it shouldn't really be, for this audience, it shouldn't really be around how easy it is and the fact you can cook it in 10 minutes. It should be access to a wider set of, uh, wider set of ingredients you might not normally try and you can get it delivered to your door. Um, so I think there's a massively untapped um, audience here in these baby boomers who happen to have a lot of disposable income, many of them, they tend, we tend to find they're interested in a diverse set of, set of cooking and, and recipes than they used to be, but they're still being kind of spending their time with these more traditional brands. I think there's an opportunity there for some of these uh, newer brands who've got more kind of disruptive products, um, such as uh, uh, meal kits, to kind of, uh, kind of position themselves well to those audiences. If anyone works for one of those brands and wants to debate that with me, I would love to have that, I would love to have that discussion, but I think it's a massive untapped opportunity there. Um, another thing that we saw kind of early on was how people were procrastinating. Um, so we looked at things like sports and various other things. You might think it's odd that in the first few weeks, um, interest in sports and entertainment, football, baseball, and basketball was up. This was mainly people trying to work out whether seasons were going to be cancelled, what was going to happen, and so on and so forth. So while you know, this, was, this was a period where games were being cancelled, seasons were being cancelled, all that other kind of stuff. And so it was actually kind of an uptick in people's engagement with those, with those kind of things. And then around week three, I think it was, week three, week four, we suddenly saw a massive spike in, in kind of other types of procrastination, board games, card games, online games, all this other kind of stuff. Um, and so we're thinking at the time, we're thinking, are these two things going to kind of, we're starting to see the beginning of sport coming down, being replaced with these kind of other forms of procrastination, board games, card games, online games. Is this going to continue? Um, no. Um, it turned out this, this was just a little spike here. I think around week four, people had not yet discovered the Zoom happy hour um, with their friends. They were trying to work out what the hell am I going to do with this time if I can't go out. So we're trying this. Turns out it didn't really last. And actually, the interest in board and card games and online games has actually fallen 
since pre-pandemic at this point, which is not something any of us are expecting, uh, who was looking at this data kind of in week four. Um, and we've now seen a massive uptick in terms of people's engagement in sport, sports, even against pre-pandemic. Now, part of this is seasonal because obviously there's, there's been the draft and there's been the, the uh, more recently the, the baseball reopening again. But actually, people seem to be going back into their old, uh, their old engagements. They're spending more time online, at least, perhaps because they can't go to games and things like this. They're spending more of their time online engaging in kind of sporting uh, uh, kind of content. All right. So if, that was, if that's kind of generally how people have been coping with the pandemic over the last few weeks, what is it meant to retail? Um, so... Obviously, very early on, week three, we saw absolute shock as retailers were shutting down their stores, right? So massive amount of store closures across the entire country, and it's been, it's been devastating to some of these brands. Um, however, there's been some odd surging retail categories. This is online, so we can't cover what, you know, and some of this stuff is stuff that people would traditionally have bought for um, kind of in, in stores, so some of it will absolutely be due to that. But in terms of online behavior, we've seen massive spikes um, in two areas in particular. Home goods kind of make sense. You're staying at home more. You'd normally go to a physical store to maybe look at a desk or a table or a chair. We've seen a 3x increase and the amount of time people are looking at home goods online and actually purchasing um, home goods online. So there's a big opportunity there. There was a surprising shot, uh, thing though, which was fashion. Nobody expected people to be you know, spending more time looking at fashion content online and particularly purchasing fashion online. Generally these things you know, logically seem to be related to people going out more and going to big events, or at least that, that's what I thought. So we dug into this one a little bit. What are people actually doing? This kind of stuff that's generally categorized as fashion. What are people actually buying? Turns out the biggest single trend that we've seen um, is actually pajama pants. Pajama pants are the new business casual. If you own some or you are responsible for the marketing and the website of some uh, online retailer, um, I would thoroughly recommend that you put your pajama pants on the front page. It is backing off a little bit now. But certainly kind of uh, in April, I know that I've bought pajama pants more than once now. I'm, I'm wearing some now. I'm not going to show you. Um, but people are starting to find comfort in working from home. So very early on, massive shock. People are starting to get used in April to kind of working from home. They're kitting out their houses to make them a little more comfortable. They're doing it online, perhaps for the first time. And as they're thinking about fashion, they're not really thinking about fashion to go out. They're thinking about fashion in terms of comfort. I think that tells a story, and I think it's really interesting, um, certainly to web stores and some fashion brands out there, about their value proposition to customers. Um, the other interesting shift that we've seen is a shift in home goods moving from desktop to mobile. It's a fairly significant shift, and it seems to be kind of um, growing. So home goods, when they were purchased online, were typically purchased on desktop. They're fairly considered purchases. You want to look at a lot of information on one screen. Similar to kind of travel and various other things, people tend to book them um, on, uh, on desktop and then to go ahead and purchase. Um, however, we've seen a significant shift to people buying their home goods on mobile devices. If you're selling home goods, please bear that in mind. This trend does not appear to be going away. If anything, it appears to be growing. So please make sure both your, your advertising and your, your customer journey on, uh, you know, on, on site or in app um, is very, very mobile friendly um, because this is something that we expect to continue. So um, next area I want to touch on is tech and gaming. What trends have we seen here? Um, so no big surprise, there's been over a 25% increase in people looking at computer peripherals, um, kind of mice and uh, keyboards and all that kind of stuff. Oh, where am I going? Um, and equally, we've seen a lot, a big surge in people interested in computer and video gaming. Um, this is probably because there's not much else to do these days. Um, I'm looking for entertainment at home. I've run out of my Netflix box sets. Um, so what else am I gonna do? I'm gonna go and potentially, potentially for the first time get into computer and video gaming. Um, we've seen a spiky behavior when it comes to computer peripherals. Um, so again, agility is really key when it comes to getting your message out and your value proposition, proposition out in market if you're there. Computer and video gaming seems to be fairly, um, fairly steady growth. Um, so we seem to see you know, that seems to be something, at least during lockdown, there seems to be a, a fairly uh, common trend there. Um, interestingly, as we looked at different games that kind of resonated, um, 
these kind of calming escapist games, particularly Animal Crossing's Animal Crossing New Horizons has got this amazing amount of sustained interest in it, right? So um, I don't know whether this is just a phenomenal game or whether it's particularly relevant to the times, but it's very rare to see post-launch this much kind of interest in, in, in a single game. You typically see these kind of shapes as we saw with the kind of Final Fantasy VII and with Doom Eternal, but we're seeing with Animal Crossing New Horizons, there's a sustained interest there. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure quite how to interpret that yet, um, but it, it, it's definitely, definitely different. Um, so is Animal Crossing the next uh, Minecraft? I don't know, um, but it's definitely a, there's definitely something different there compared to more traditional games. Um, more exciting, I think, is we're starting to see a long overdue shift in the people who are looking at kind of platform and console game, uh, console and PC games, and we're seeing a significant shift of female gamers. Um, this, to my mind, is long overdue. I think I was probably born 15 years too early. I would not have had to waste my 14 through 20 um, ages um, making terrible music to try and have something interesting to talk about with, with women um, had, had I been born 15 years later. We are seeing a long overdue shift um, of uh, female gamers moving from mobile, which had, we've seen a large growth over the last five years in mobile gamers um, who, who, are, who are women. We're now starting to see that shift, that trend towards uh, PC games and console games. This is probably brought about in response to the pandemic. Um, and I think it's a huge, huge opportunity for some of those console manufacturers. We're seeing a huge uptick there to kind of latch onto that audience and make them their console of choice, this generation and next generation, by really leaning into that, that emerging trend, which is, you know, this is a statistically significant, massive move um, in, in that, and, and long overdue um, for, for female gamers. Um, all right, automotive, the next big area that we're seeing some fairly big shops in. Um, the interest in car comparison dealer pages very early on, as you might imagine, fell off a cliff. People just were not interested. I'm never leaving my house ever again. The world's coming to an end. Why the hell would I buy a new car? And then around this period, we started to see interest in people looking at things like a car comparison websites and things like this, and also on dealer pages, are they designing cars and things. And then over the next few weeks, we saw it increase by 50% again. We spotted this trend because it kind of stuck out massively. We were, kind of, we were wondering where the bottom was going to be. And then all of a sudden, we saw this massive uptick. I do not know why. I would love somebody on this call to tell me why between some point in mid-April and May, we saw a massive increase. I know that some dealers were talking about putting offers out in market. It might have been related to that, but I've looked to try and see if there's anything massive happening. Around it. I haven't found anything. If anyone knows, I would love to learn. But um, without knowing why, we did see this massive uptick in people suddenly looking at car reviews, car comparison websites, and going to dealer pages and looking for, looking, you know, doing things like uh, building their own vehicle and, and looking at the costs and so on and so forth. Interestingly, about six weeks later than that, all of a sudden, um, sales start going up. Not a massive shock. A car is a reasonably considered purchase. Um, you're probably not just going to go and buy it because they discount it by 10%. You probably want to do a hell, hell of a lot of research. But it, it was really exciting to see that um, week 6, six through 8, April, April 12th to May 2nd, we saw a 48% increase. And we saw not quite 48%, but a significant surge in June about uh, in terms of car sales. Um, it's really... And I think, you know, it, great lesson for brands here. Um, you have to move fast. During this period, people are looking at car review sites. You need to be top of mind at this point so you can capitalize on it six weeks later, particularly in such a dynamic kind of, with such dynamic behavioral shifts going on. Um, I think if you just cut your budget back here, um, your competition is going to beat you because they're going to have their value messaging out in front of these customers who are kind of, uh, who, who are kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, considering purchasing. Um, I think we're going to see, probably not, we won't get kind of financial numbers out for, for, um, for at least 12 months, I don't think, the, the useful financial numbers. But I think we'll start to see which automotive brands are smart and continue to spend on media during this period here are likely to have kind of skewed the odds in their favour a little bit. I know obviously with autos, it takes a long time to move the needle, but I do think that this has been a real opportunity for some, for some of those auto brands. And I, but I don't think we'll actually see the consequence of that probably for another 12 months yet. Um, moving quickly on to finance. Um, 
interestingly, we've seen an increase in interest in, in well, traditional banking, um, first and foremost. This is the dark blue line here, and particular spike around first stimulus, stimulus checks being deposited. And this is people making sure that they've got a good bank account to put this, this check into. Um, some of them might not have even had bank accounts before that, um, and they needed to create one. So a significant uptick in kind of, in kind of banking online and, and trying to find an account and working out how to deposit a check. If the bank stores aren't open, the bank branches aren't open, that's kind of backed off now. So we did see a big spike here. So there was a big opportunity potentially to, cap, to capture market share, particularly around first stimulus checks being deposited around here. That seems to have backed off. And we're now kind of back you know, below uh, where, we, where we were pre-COVID in terms of banking. Investing, on the other hand, we're starting to see this kind of gradual trend. People, you always tend to find that when markets are a little bit more volatile, there's a little bit more interest in, in, in investing. Um, but this is significant. Around this time, again, post first stimulus checks, um, you know, maybe people are considering investing that. Um, but equally, we saw some shifts in the market with the Fed deploying um, uh, cash into the market, propping up the credit markets, stock markets doing a little bit better than expected. I think a lot of people are kind of, um, uh, are kind of seeing that as an opportunity and are more interested in investing. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're investing more. At the moment, it does tell us there's definitely um, more of a mind to, in, to, to investment. And so I think there's a real opportunity there for, for, for positioning of financial institutions to capitalize on this and make sure that they're top of mind when it comes to people if they do decide to go ahead and invest and maybe do some education and because I think um, there's likely to be more people um, considering investing potentially for the first time. And so I think there's a real opportunity and there's some really fascinating kind of demographic breakouts there um, that, um, that I'm, I'm happy to share um, if people are really interested. Um, dining and travel, moving into a different category now. Um, obviously, um, dining um, was down massively. We've seen massive growth in kind of uh, online food delivery, but generally saw massive um, um, shift um, down in, in, in dining until about May, May 22nd. Then all of a sudden, restrictions on restaurants and entertainment were lifted in certain states, and we saw a big spike, 17% up in dining week over week. Travel, again, road to reopening. This is the good news story. Weeks 12 to 15, travel went down, 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 down. And then through weeks 12 to 15, we saw a big spike. Um, interesting trend here. As we look across all airlines, significant uptick in people booking non-coach travel. So this is clearly people who probably need to fly or they desperately want to fly. If they are going to fly, they, they, there's a significantly more interest in non-coach travel. Um, I think this tells a really interesting story. I think if you are an airline here and you are wanting to, um, if you, you, you've been competing solely on price with your competitors, which has been killing your entire industry and your, and your brand, um, now is an opportunity to position yourself on something other than price. Um, premium seating is really, I think it's probably just people wanting to be a little bit safer um, on, on the flight. And so you probably need to think about your positioning and not lead solely with price and start thinking about, thinking about that. Um, but this seems to have been kind of pre prevalent throughout the pandemic and doesn't seem to be going away. Significant sh shift away from purely cost conscious economy seats into having um, a little bit more space, which I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm guessing is related to safety. Um, the other thing that we've seen, not a massive shock, but something that I don't, I haven't seen enough hotels kind of latch onto, significant shifts in terms of where your travel's coming from, massive amount of it now coming locally, and some of it kind of hyper-locally. This is not people who are coming, kind of driving four hours to get to you. This is people who are driving 30 minutes to get to you, booking shorter trips, right? So I think there's a massive opportunity here, certainly in terms of who you're reaching with your marketing. There seems to be a trend. It seems to be growing, if anything, for people to be doing a lot more local travel within state, sometimes only kind of 30 minutes away from, from, from kind of where they live. Um, this doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. So making sure that you're, you're again, you're positioning your brand, your hotel, your travel offer um, to take advantage of this, um, I think is really key right now um, and, um, and is, is likely to prevail as long as this, this pandemic continues. Um, May 21st, uh, Las Vegas plans to reopen. June 4th, Sin City reopens its doors. We start to see a lot of stuff coming to market. I actually want to finish all of these insights on a nice positive note. Um, we saw Vegas booking. Very fortunate we work with a large number of the, the hotels in Vegas, helping them um, sell rooms. We saw Vegas bookings drop off a cliff. This was massively depressing. 
However, right now, we're actually back to normal. Something we did not expect to happen. This doesn't mean that the number of people in hotels right now um, are the same as they were kind of pre-COVID, but it does mean the booking rate is back up. People are typically booking a little bit further in advance. They're taking advantage of some of the amazing offers there are out there, but we're certainly seeing some big spikes and it might not continue to be exactly kind of pre-COVID levels, but we've definitely seen a massive surge. So what Vegas have done in terms of their value propositioning and getting those offers out into market seems to be working, at least at filling hotel rooms for the future. I think it's a really good and reassuring story for Vegas. Um, obviously, with, with COVID numbers coming back up, time will tell. We're starting to see it back off again a, a little bit now. But I think it's a really good story for how if you act quickly, get the right value message out in market, you can, you can kind of turn the tide pretty quickly. On this kind of stuff. So what have we learned throughout this pandemic by kind of looking day over day and week over week? The first thing is consumer behavior is going to change. It changes really quickly. Right now it's changing faster than ever before. We see big trends. Often we don't know where they come from and some of them are these spikes such as interest in board games and online games that go away. Others are kind of trends which we see kind of gradually growing over time such as people being interested in premium seating on planes, or a shift towards female gamers when it comes to kind of PC and console games. Um, we've also learned that people adapt and are going digital across all of the generations. Um, people are much more adaptable than we often give them credit for, and all of a sudden we've got a lot of interest um, in, in products that are primarily positioned to kind of millennials and, and Gen Z are actually being picked up by generations, uh, you know, no, by all generations, and people are kind of adapting in terms of lifestyle, in terms of what they spend their time in, in terms of, in terms of how they purchase and go about their daily lives. The third thing is, um, there's, I think there's a real opportunity right now to capture new prospects and grow market share. A lot of people, there was a report from the IAB which was stating that for the first time in a long time, people are going to be trying new brands. Um, and I think thinking outside of, uh, of your normal box, I think is a real opportunity to grab market share at this point. To do so, I think you need to be agile. Agility is gonna be absolutely key. If you spend six weeks to make a decision, to try and get a value proposition out in market just to test it, you're gonna miss the opportunity. We've seen this with um, stay at home schooling. I saw a number of brands all of a sudden try and latch onto this, but the surge in interest had already gone. You need to be agile in such a dynamic market. Um, if you're interested in more in-depth insights here, if you go to podcast.com forward slash insights, we've got insights broken out by each of those categories that go a little bit further in depth. Um, we are doing another one of these, and the next one's going to be very different, very different webinar. Today I've just blasted you with information in a hope that you can take a little nugget from there and apply it to what you're doing out in market, or maybe your, what, your, what your customers are doing out in market. The next one's going to be a fundamentally different innovate session which is machine learning 101 separating fact from fiction where i'm going to be going back to my roots in machine learning and helping all of you understand what machine learning is how it works why it's important and help you separate out what the buzzword is from from the reality and how it's going to be transformative over the next 10 years so that's the next one please do register um, if you're interested in doing that but um that's the end of the content i've got but i think we're going to open up to a q a now travis yeah yeah absolutely thank you so much peter um We've got some great questions um, in the channel and we'll be answering more if, um, if anybody out there would like to submit any. Um, I think, you know, just really quickly um, and, and tying on to your last webinar, how does the cookie play into this and how, how, do, how do we see these insights changing or altering with, um, you know, the eventual replacement of the third party cookie moving into 2022? Yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, in order, to, in order to get some of these insights, you do need to be able to correlate user activity as they move across the web. So as they go from Forbes to BuzzFeed to Reddit, you should touch the same, same person. The predominant way we do it today was with cookies, but um, you can do it equally well using um, logged in user bases if you can get any scale in that. And I think we'll see a trend there. And you can do it using probabilistic methods. So if we're 90% certain it's the same person between there and there, as long as you add up those numbers in a sensible way, you can still get the same level of insight. In fact, a lot of these insights become a lot richer when you avoid the third party cookie, because all of a sudden you can get the same level of insights in things like iOS, uh, which is the, you know, your, your, and your, your Apple device, get the same level of insights there. So we're actually now starting to shift all of our insights work away from using cookies at all, because we actually find using what we call a probabilistic identifier, um, coupled with a fairly large deterministic seed set, 
um, allows us to model the entire internet rather than just the trackable internet, which is only about half of it. Um, so the, the, it essentially remains the same. In order to get decent probabilistic identity, you need to have high fidelity information, which means integrations into as many places as possible. And you need to apply reasonably robust statistics to make sure you don't all of a sudden start overcounting things and so on and so forth. Um, but, um, but yeah, it doesn't change much in, in the grand scheme of things. It just makes it a little bit more complicated in terms of how you join the information together. All right, so um, question here on, on auto as it relates to Tesla, right? So um, Tesla's been going crazy in terms of growth and stock. How much, you know, is there, if the assumption is Tesla is driving that, how would somebody go about checking that assumption or, you know, for it to be, to be right or that something else is actually driving that interest in automotive? Um, yes, yeah, so um, the, 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 the automotive show, stuff I showed there, um, actually the majority of it didn't come from Tesla at all. Um, there was a very small contribution from Tesla on that automotive thing. In fact, they, they were not an outlier when it came to people um, actually increasing, increasing their interest in consumption. Um, there was no spike towards Tesla otherwise. I looked for that because I thought the same. There hasn't been a massive upsurge relative to the rest of auto in Tesla. I think, I mean, I've got a lot of opinions on Tesla. I think a really interesting company. They've done some phenomenal things technologically. I think time will tell. At the moment, their stock price um, basically says that they're not an auto company. They're some other kind of new category of company um, yet to be defined. Um, and that's interesting. We'll see whether that plays out, whether they can get their distribution channels up um, faster and they're scaling up faster than some of their comp the more entrenched competitors who are making, making some technological advances. So I think the auto industry is gonna be a really fascinating one to watch. Um, over the next kind of few years. My personal belief is that self-driving cars are a little bit further away than some of the hype. And so some of those fundamentally new business models, which I think are, are starting to give some of these companies a, a slightly frothy valuation, um, yeah, it's a little bit too early. So I think one of the reasons that, that you know, Tesla's valuation is where it is, is because you know, there's, there's this prospect that effectively they, they have a fleet of cars and they own all transport and all that other kind of stuff. I, I, I think that's a little bit further away um, so same as it was for Uber. Um, it's a little bit further away than maybe some people are predicting just because you know, getting a 99% self-driving car is an order of magnitude simpler than getting 100%. Uh, um, uh, 100, 100, I don't know why I'm starting to talk about Tesla and self-driving cars now. But um, the, the short answer to that, 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 um, that question is there wasn't a particular bias towards interest in Tesla. Um, that was kind of pretty much across the board. Um, I think the biggest predictor um, of who will win um, and we probably will have some more analysis on this coming um, a little bit later, uh, will be who was out in market with the right value propositions du during that period. Um, we'll take, take a slight skew. And as always, people tend to stick with their auto brands. So um, th th there'll be an element of that too. Um, but yeah, I, we didn't see a massive surge towards Tesla at all. The Tesla company valuation, I think, is a really interesting one. Um, and time will tell whether they're able to actually um, actually turn, turn that, that valuation into a, into a a truly sustainable, phenomenal scale business. Okay, so we've got um, a couple of questions that are similar here. And, and one of the things that people have noted is that the effect of COVID has been disproportionate in its impact for verticals um, as well as for individuals. So do we have insights or have we thought about in, or seen anything around luxury items, right? Because what you know, again with the disproportionate impact um, that this has had on individuals and in different income segments have we seen luxury items hold strong to where they were pre-covid have they gone down what have we um, seen any real insights there I, i've got to be honest i i haven't seen anything pop out um sometimes you have to go and explicitly look for these things and it's not something um that, that we have thought to go look at it's a great observation and certainly something straight after this I'm going to go and dig into. Um, but yeah, we've, we've certainly seen that some of the patterns that are online tend to be more demographic based than anything else, right? Which is interesting. So um, in fact, I'm going to do something which anyone who helped me set up this webinar is going to hate right now. Um, I'm going to drop into our data science environment um, here. Um, where are we? Please ignore all this code. It's not really important. Um, Interestingly, this is, this is a cohort of people who are consuming content related to masks right now across the country. And, and you tend to, it tends to be around a large geo populations here. So you can see that. But um, sorry, where was I? What was I about to tell you? It's something about demographics, right? Um, right. Uh, 
put this is very unprofessional. Right, what, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to query um, using our kind of this proprietary database engine. I'm looking at um, a persona, which is people who are, who are kind of interested in buying masks right now. Um, and look at, look at it in terms of demographics across the US and looking at across um, states across the US. And we can run these kind of queries fairly quickly. This is exactly the same technology that powers our planning tools. So you can do that. You can do a lot of this just using our interactive UI. You don't need to know all this kind of stuff. Um, this is running for every day um, for the last three months. Um, and we can kind of look at these trends broken out, as I say, by demographics and by state in terms of interest in, in masks and purchasing masks. He says that is something's gone horribly wrong there. Um, as we start plotting this, if you look at it by state, this interest in masks here um, tends to be very spiky, right? And this is this tends to be because there's been some state has issued some order related to stay at home or masks. And so you tend to be very, but there's no kind of prevailing trends there. However, when you look at it by demographic down here, you tend to see fairly prevailing trends. And people who are unlikely to be looking into researching buying masks, are what, what's at the bottom here? Um, young people um, and um, people from um, diverse e ethnic backgrounds, people who are most likely to be interested are elderly people and well-educated people. So we're starting to see, and, and well-off people, there's a, very, there's a lot of well-off people up here educated. So we seem to see a, a little bit of a split, which tends to be less, the state you're in tends to be much less predictive than some of your demographics. Uh, I think that if anyone on this call is working with the government on how they're getting information out there in terms of trying to convince people to wear masks and things, I think it's actually a really telling indicator of how they need to change their messaging rather than just blanket, blank, blanket a certain state. I think there's a correlation there. I don't think it's causal. Um, but certainly across the board, some of the biggest trends that we've kind of seen emerge um, have been um, demographic-wise, which, which is odd. Generally, we saw demographics kind of coming together um, in, terms of, in terms of their behaviours online. We start to see that kind of spit out a little bit um, during, during the pandemic. Um, which I think is, is interesting, telling, um, a little bit troubling, um, and, uh, but also uh, an opportunity for learning to how to position things differently. Okay, um, question around any insights in the behavior of folks that feel confident dining in versus going out? Um, dining in versus going out, um, it, the, the biggest shift that we saw, saw early on was, um, was uh, state by state. And also the biggest predictor was the number of COVID cases. Um, and that, that was the biggest shift. Um, there, was, there was nothing much more to it than that. Um, you tended to find that um, older people stay, stay going out for longer, which was odd. Um, we didn't expect that, but that didn't seem to last. The biggest predictor was simply the, the number of COVID cases in the specific area. So inside cities, particularly cities that have been kind of ravaged with, with terrible case counts and things, obviously people are staying at home. Um, cities that were impacted later on, they, they stayed going out. Certainly people outside of cities tend to go out more because the case count is lower. So people living in suburbs and other parts of the country um, tend to have been less impacted by that. Biggest predictor, case count and state legislation. Um, which tend to drive news, and then that becomes self-reinforcing um, after a little while. You tend to find when one of these shocks happens, um, it lasts for about nine days. We've seen that across a number of these trends. Stuff gets announced, all of a sudden you go from eating out at 100% to eating out at 5%, and then gradually it finds a new normal somewhere in between. But about nine days seems to be the, the average time that we've seen these kind of blips um, uh, happen for. Okay, so um, this question is about e-commerce, but I, I think it's really, um, it's tied to anything that we have seen, right? So COVID has had, again, disproportionate impacts on demand. Um, yeah. And the question is, e-commerce specifically has surged, and we could say that with a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, all of the tech uh, products for, um, for home use and efficiency uh, in remote working have surged as well. Do we see that surge continuing to the same level? Do we see it kind of leveling off to a middle ground? Where, where do we think, or have we seen any insights that, that show the staying power of these trends? I, I mean, it definitely seems to be staying during, during the, the, the COVID time, right? So who knows how long we're all gonna be in the situation. Like, so it's certainly, it's definitely got staying power. Um, we haven't seen it kind of spike and then go, go away in terms, of the, in terms of these budgets. I mean, that being said, certain areas such as home furnishings and things, there was a clear spike as people were trying to kind of, you know, um, um, find kit out their offices and stuff like that. But generally, most of those trends seem to be saying at least during the pandemic. 
The other interesting thing is that people are do seem to be trying new brands for the first time. There's a real opportunity right now for grabbing market share. As I said, there's a huge opportunity there. Um, people are doing things for the first time. That puts you, you know, I read a lot of books on psychology, but once you start doing one thing for a new time, for the first time, you can often do other things for the, for the first time, right? It's a change in mental state. And so there's a real opportunity right now, particularly for kind of um, uh, up, up and coming brands to disrupt and, and kind of capture some of that growth. So I think the, the growth, the, the shift is there to stay at least during the kind of coronavirus thing. I think we'll find a new normal when people return to work and, and start working in offices and things, whenever that happens. I, I imagine, but this is this is not backed by data, this is just my hunch. I imagine some of these will find a new normal, which is somewhere between the two. Um, but certainly um, we've seen across tech, we've seen across um, a lot of kind of e-commerce and things, there's been significant win of market share from more traditional businesses. And there's been change in consumer behavior, trying to find new things to do with their time, such as console gaming and various other things. And even we've seen upticks in people buying software to do things like you know, create create art and various other things. So we've seen those trends. They're certainly there to stay at the moment for the for the for the for the duration of the pandemic. I imagine we we'll see a little bit of a rebalance as things go back to work, but that's just a hunch. Um, I'm no more educated than anyone else there. Um, all right. So um, this is a similar question, Peter, and you kind of touched on it, but you know. We're, we're at home now and, and all of these, these fluctuations have been taking place during COVID, such as time spent online, et cetera. How much of this do we think may be permanent in terms of when we do go back to work and have more of a, of a return to normalcy? Um, I, think, I think right now permanence is hard because we, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're adapting to this new normal and then we'll have to adapt again. Uh, I think trying to predict pr trying to predict the future at this point is incredibly difficult. My advice to every brand, every agency at the moment is to not focus on predicting the future, but focus on agility, right? Focus on your ability to test and learn, get things out into market quickly, shorten your decision-making cycles. I think there's, there's a tendency in uncertain times, you've got less information to go on sometimes, um, things are moving around a lot more, and so people actually shy away from making decisions. And actually right now you need rapid decision-making. You need to be getting stuff out and taking a, a, account of trends. So I think predicting what's gonna be permanent, I think is quite difficult, but I think it's a massive opportunity right now. If you can be fast, if you can be agile, if you can make decisions quickly, um, if you can position your brand to a new cohort of customers in an interesting way for a couple of weeks and seeing if it works and then changing it again, um, you know, fundamentally connecting those core marketing tenets of you know, value positioning and, and where you execute and all that other kind of stuff. So. Um, I think there's a real opportunity and I wouldn't, I'd advise people not to focus on what's permanent and what's not permanent right now, particularly when it comes to marketing and, and how you're positioning your brand, but to think, but to optimize for velocity, optimize for rapid decision-making, getting stuff out in market and testing and learning. All right, Peter, um, technical question here. Do we have a take on OpenAI's GPT-3 and its potential impact on brands? I don't have a technical take on that. Okay, fair, en fair enough. Sorry. I, I don't either. Um. I, 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 will, I will come up with a technical take on it. If, if you get the name of the person who asked the question, I will have a, uh, I'll have a quick deep dive into that with our ML team and we'll, we'll get back to you on that one. But I, at the moment, I've been, I've been the same as everyone else trying to cope yeah. with um, surviving with uh, my kids uh, in the house. Fair, fair enough. Okay, uh, last one. Have we seen any insights as related to um, uh, professional changes or job searches or anything in, in that, uh, that category? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously been huge changes, uh, huge shifts in terms of job searches. You know, unfortunately, there's been a lot of people across the country kind of being, you know, being, being laid off. Unfortunately, that seems to have disproportionately affected um, the, the people less, less likely to stand it, um, tend to be poorer, poorer, uh, poorer um, people. Um, but yeah, no, we've seen some massive shifts there, certainly in terms of time spent online, looking, looking at job postings and things. Um, and interestingly, the biggest, the biggest area that we've seen um, looking for new positions are recruiters. Um, so th there's been, you know, we've seen, we've seen some spikes there. Um, obviously, um, uh, not happy times for certain numbers of people. In terms of general professions, um, it's been hard to observe anything beyond that, um, other than seeing big spikes. Um, they seem to be kind of remaining. Um, we still see a lot of people kind of spending a lot of time, you know, looking at resume stuff and, and resume polishing and, 
and looking at um, sites and company reviews and, and, and all that other kind of stuff. Um, it doesn't seem to be backing off. Um, it's not something I've got a, a, a day over day index on. Um, it's definitely something that's again, it's a great idea. Um, I think we'll, um, we'll definitely take that as input into our next round of insights. Um, but I know very early on, we saw a big spike there. Um, and um, it doesn't seem to have disappeared yet in terms of people looking for jobs. We can't infer things like number of people laid off because we can only get things based on what we see online. So we tend to see a slightly lagged effect, which is people looking for jobs. We can see, we can't see, oh, well, this company has laid off 300 people, for example. But we've definitely seen, <clears throat> seen some patterns there. Unfortunately, it does seem to be disproportionately affecting um, uh, uh, less well-off demographics. Um, that's, the other, that's the other sad thing about this. Um, but, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll actually do a little bit of analysis on that because I think it's an interesting topic. Okay, so that, that concludes um, all of the questions that we have. Um, so, and we are also right at time. So again, for, for the 129 folks that are, are still on the phone, I wanna thank you so much for your time and for participating. Um, our next webinar is right around the corner and we look forward to seeing everybody um, there as well. Thanks so much.